I'm preparing to speak, you know, and, and uh, I was listening to a doctor this week uh, lecturing other doctors, and after about 30 minutes in or 45 minutes into his lecture, he says, he said, I, I've, something like, I, I've just, that was my introduction. And then he laughed. He said, my kids make fun of me for having such long introductions. And then he, he said, but this, I said all that just to say this. And I thought, boy, how many times have I done that? And so then I was just kind of thinking in my own mind, why do I do that? And then this thought hit me. I'm going to ask you a question. When you come together, whether it's a church service, a seminar, or you're just going to go be with friends or you're meeting somebody for coffee, but predominantly let's think a little bit about, you know, uh, Jesus taught his disciples on the hills of Galilee. Who should prepare more for the service? The speaker or the hearers? The speaker, how important is it that the speaker prepares himself and prepares his message? And I remember when I first started, I know that there were some pastors I talked to, and they said they spend 40 hours preparing their message. They lock themselves up in their office, and I go, wow, that'd be really hard for me not to do that. At the same time, I have to say that I don't lock myself in an office to prepare a message, but... You know, somebody has asked me, you know, how long did you, how long did it take you to get that message? Well, it's been about 62 years. Because it's a life-flowing thing. It's not a study and, and, a, and pass an exam, <laughs> you know, thing. It's real life. So, um, preparation, you know, Mark was talking about, you know, our confidence source when we, when we, we prepared for something. And so I think it's really important, you know, because people are actually taking time out of their day and everything else to show up and to listen, and uh, you got to have something to say. But then on the other hand, I was thinking about all this, and I thought, why do sometimes I take and others take, you know, 30 minutes to, to, for uh, introduction? And if it's done right and it can be done wrong, it would be to prepare you to hear. Sometimes it takes that long to set the stage and to get the atmosphere right to say one thing. But if you just said it out loud, it would just fly over people's ears. They wouldn't hear it. They wouldn't, wouldn't take it in, wouldn't have it in the right context to hear it. So you have to set the stage of why what you're going to say is so important. But, uh, but again, part of it is, What's our responsibility as hearers? Is it, should, we have more, should we take more time to prepare what we're going to say when we go have coffee, or should we take more time to prepare to what we're going to hear? And I think, I think in general terms, it would be human nature would be prepare more to what you're going to say, because everybody knows that you get in a conversation, you're not really listening, you're just thinking about what you're going to say. But when Jesus was here, he just said, man, you, uh, be careful what you listen to. And if you've got ears to hear, you'll hear. And in all reality, nobody takes in a whole 30 minutes or hour preaching. I, you know, you guys have been telling me that for years. <laughs> not, i got to be honest. I, I don't ever prepare a message without thinking about Steve Christensen. <laughs> it's... <laughs> just saying, you know, we can only take so much. <laughs> it's not that I, I've tried, Steve. It just it's, I don't know why I am who I, who I am. But but seriously, in a seminar or you know, the, uh, there's uh, Jim Richards once said, in uh, people who spend ten thousand dollars to go to a seminar, the the bulk of them won't won't apply one thing that they hear. About, I think it's like 80% don't apply anything they heard. And you'd think if you paid $10,000, you'd pay more attention, wouldn't you? But so what's that mean when you just have a free message all the time? You know, here, Here's the key to life. Is the key is to hear and really understand and apply it. 
And if you take one thing, you don't need to know the 30 minutes of the 40 minutes. You don't need to, but boy, just is this taking one thing. So when I listen to these, these doctors and stuff, sometimes I, I, I think the whole thing is awesome, but I think what one thing can I take away from this and apply to my life? And my life will start improving. So I, I just wanted to drop that in there. That, uh, what, and I'm going to ask you, what do you do to prepare to hear? Yeah, I have a lot of people that just say, man, I need to be back in church. I want to be there. But, you know, it's, uh, Sunday's my only day off, and I just, uh, I just relax. And, and I said, that's great. And uh, it's everybody's choice what they're going to do. But even those that show up, what preparations? What can we do? What do you do to prepare to hear? The Bible says a farmer waits being patient for the precious harvest uh, until he, it gets the early and the latter rain. Jesus said it this way, a man casts seed on the ground and goes to bed and, and by night and gets up by day and it grows. He doesn't know how. But one of the keys to that is there has to be something planted. A lot of people are just waiting to see what happens in life and waiting to see what happens in their life. But just waiting isn't going to do anything for you. There, first of all, has to be something planted. And if you got something planted, then you can actually be like a farmer and go to bed at peace and get up and do your things there today and know that that crop is going to grow. It may take three months, may take six months. For some things, it may take years. But if there's nothing planted, nothing's going to grow. And so just waiting around for seeing what life is going to do is, to me, is, is a waste of time. And, and you lost out on the precious gift of life. But if there's something planted, and so Jesus always said, you know, uh, that which is planted. Let me read to you. Uh, well, let me just also say this, that everything that we do believe can be strengthened in our, you know, we can grow in our faith. Let me, let me give you an example. I, I believe getting hit by a car would really, really hurt. Okay? I mean, even if you just got bumped, it could really, really hurt. And I have to be honest, I'm pretty blessed. I don't think I can recall one time of being hit. Uh, I just don't recall even the craziness we did on the farm. I don't recall getting hit by a car. And I've always believed it's really wise to look both directions. It's really wise to look around and not get hit by a car. But I took some training with the uh, Lawrence County Sheriff's Department, and they showed us videos of uh, video after video of people getting hit by cars, especially law enforcement and first responders when they're there in an accident and then somebody comes and hits them. And I'm telling you, it reinforced my faith that being hit would be a real bad thing. I mean, when I saw bodies flying through the air and everything else, I, I really don't have much fear about that, whatever else, but I, I'm telling you, I, I, I literally go, wow, that's a big problem. And that's why they were showing it to us, because one of the biggest problems we have with accidents is the law enforcement and the first responders are being hit by cars because they get to look into what's going on and they drive right, right into the cars and right in, you know, and it's like, and so I, I was thinking, you know, they just said, you've got to be aware when this is happening. I go, man, that's not, that's not good news for me because if I sit down with somebody, if I was in an accident and, and have been and I'm, I'm sitting there paying attention and trying to help that person listen to them, I have the ability to really focus and, and, and look at somebody and be, and listen. I really do contrary to a lot of people think. I have the ability to really listen well and give it my full attention. But when I do that, I'm not aware of my surroundings at all. And now, man, John, you're going to have to force yourself to, to think about watching the cars to see, can man, <laughs> and of course we know uh, we're on, we have a relative that hit, was hit 70 miles an hour. You know, he was a law enforcement in Colorado and was hit and uh, killed his friend and, and nearly killed him. So, so what I'm saying is I've always believed getting hit by a car was not a good idea, but after watching and listening to the policemen talk about how often it happens and seeing it, it really reinforced me to be aware of it. And so a lot of things in our life we believe about God or we believe about life, but that we need, you know, by listening and watching it and paying attention, we become a lot more aware. 
You know, and even what, what Tammy just shared this morning was really good, but we all know about crying out to the Lord, but boy, just hearing that and, and thinking about the example and thinking about David and thinking about all of our things, man, it just put an image in me. Man, John, step up to the plate and keep crying out to God. Man, cry out to God, you know, before you're in trouble. Cry out to, you know, and that's why I've been saying, bless me, Lord. Uh, not, not because I just want to be, uh, you know, uh, whatever, but it's like, this is how the system works. And this is what Jesus said. He said, everything I want to do in your life, the kingdom of God works this way. You've got to put a seed in your heart. And that's where it grows is in here. It's not out here that things really happen. These things are manifestations of what really takes place. So uh, anybody that's in trouble, this is where we want to focus. So let me, uh, uh, this morning I was, I usually wake up, you know, around 5, 30, uh, 6, somewhere around there. And, and I don't want to get up. And I, I like to meditate, especially on Sunday morning. I just start going through the message and all that. But sometimes I go back to sleep and et cetera. And this morning I was dreaming. And, and uh, one of our preschool kids, uh, there was this huge wolf spider or spider, you know, was crawling up this window. And uh, it was just so vivid. And it was big, like, you know. And this little girl in our preschool is really gutsy. And she went over there to grab that thing. And she was trying to grab it. And I was trying to say, don't touch that thing, you know. And she grabbed that and pulled that out, and then this thing, legs came up and just grabbed her fingers, and it was weird. They were like, like little vice grips or something, you know, and I finally got that spider away from me, and it was grabbing me. <laughs> and, and I was, you know, uh, you know when you're feeling it, you know, it's like, man, and now I kind of wake up and go, oh, man, that, no, that, that's an ugly feeling to have a spider pulling on your fingers, you know, and... And then I, I, then I went, you know, and I was thinking again, and literally I was thinking about the sermon and all that, and then I'd fall back to sleep, and then I'd dream again, and all of a sudden I'm in the cellar, and this thing is on me, and I think, I need, I need to shoot this thing. I don't know why I thought I needed to shoot it, okay, but I'm trying to get a, a figure out how to get out, and, uh, out to shoot this thing, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and I, anyway, this happened for over an hour and a half this morning, just I'd in and out of this dream, and, and it just started... Uh, you know, giving me the willies and, and just nervousness. And, and then the spider got away on me. And uh, then, then, I, then the next things I was worried, I thought, well, I bet that spider, I mean, this thing was so big and it seemed to have an intellect. You know, it was strategizing. And I'd done it some harm and now it got free and now I'm, sw- I'm sitting there going, that thing's going to hunt me down. I, that thing's probably in the house. That thing's going to... Now I gotta. Now I'm going to have to just, you know, stay wide awake to make sure the spider don't get me, you know. So that was my morning. And I want to just say that in some ways it correlates with what, what gets planted in our hearts. And when fear gets planted in our hearts... Uh, we can go through our day and not really r- understand that some of those things that enter our heart are, are still growing and manifesting, just like the Bible says the farmer goes to bed at night and gets up in the morning and, and lives out his day, but he waits for the harvest. But boy, when negative things are planted in you, you can be living your daily life, going to bed, getting up and doing your daily life, but this thing's growing in you. This fear is growing in you. This, this uh, insecurity can grow in you. As lo- as just like good things can grow in you, evil things can grow inside of you. And you're really not always aware of it. But it doesn't mean it's not growing. So let me, let me read to you this. Um, Matthew 13, it says, Jesus says, But blessed are your eyes, because they see. You know how many people have no idea about what life is about? They've never. You and I get to hear message after message. We, we read the Bible. We, we, we think about this stuff constantly. But there are people, so many, billions of people, who absolutely don't have any clue about what life is about. And uh, if there is a God. And they've never heard a portion of what you and I have heard. And Jesus says, blessed are your eyes because they see, and blessed are your ears because they hear. 
For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Man, that has become so real to, to, to us. In our, you know, as we share the things about the kingdom, about God with people who have never heard it before, many of them have no understanding. They're, they can hear the words we're saying, but they don't have an th- idea what we're, what we're saying. They don't have any type of a vision about it, and it's easy for that just to be snatched out. Things that can revolutionize, change their life, can be just snatched away. This is, this is the one on whom so, seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown in the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no firm root in himself, but, but is only temporary. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. You know, one thing we don't always understand is this kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light are very prevalent kingdoms that are actually more real and going to last longer than, than the kingdoms of this world. And so a lot of people get wound up in all the, the governments going on and poli- poli- politics are going on. But you've got to remember, government's going to rise and fall and, and they'll, all be, they'll all be wiped down in time. But the kingdom of light is going to be forever. And I don't, know, I don't know what's going to happen in the kingdom of darkness. But the kingdom of darkness is working all, all, night and day to steal the word of the kingdom away from people's hearts. It is its only goal. It's not just destroy a person, but destroy the word, the thoughts, and the concepts of the kingdom of God that, that could enter into their, their heart. And so it is a major battle that sometimes I don't think we, I think we can kind of get uh, where we forget that we're seeing things and hearing things that for generations and uh, thousands of years people wanted to hear and wanted to see about Jesus. And now we're living in it. Verse 22, it says, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worries of the world world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it choke the word and becomes unfruitful and the one on whom seed was sown in good soil this is the man who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some hundred and some 30 and some uh, 60 and some 30 is the word of the kingdom did Jesus come just to save us from sickness, save us from poverty, save us from tragedy, save us from car wrecks. He does all those things, doesn't he? Why the, if we've had um, rollover and rollovers and lately, and uh, man, I'm just so grateful that, uh, that uh, uh, we're not doing funerals. Hallelujah, man, it's huge to me. Because we have done both, haven't we? And he does do all those things. But the kingdom, the word of God, the king, what is the, did it really, what is it here to save us from? A lot of people say it was to save us from hell. And, man, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion. We had a big discussion on Wednesday night is what's hell and is it forever? And, uh, you know, how do, what do we know about that? And I just say, I don't know much about it. Heaven, I don't know much about hell. Uh, I'm hoping to find out a lot about heaven. Don't want to find out anything about hell. You know, all I can tell you is if I burn my little tip of my finger, I don't like it. I don't like burns. And, uh, you know, and I don't like being alone. And I don't like being where it's so hot I can't breathe. I don't know what it is. I just say, I don't want to go there. I don't want to find out. I don't, and I sure don't want to take and risk odds of saying, well, I don't think it's going to be that bad. Let's find out. <laughs> I'm not interested in spending one second away from my Jesus, okay? I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's only five minutes long. I'm not doing it. If it's forever, I'm definitely, but it's just like, I'm not taking any chances here. I, but I think 
that we also need to say, he didn't just come to save us from hell. Because that's really short-sighted. That's really missing the whole... In some ways, I feel like we're missing the whole point when this is a, just a heaven and a hell discussion. What Jesus is saying here in the parable, I don't think it was just a heaven and hell discussion about the sword. I think he's trying to tell us, this is how everything in my kingdom works. Everything in my kingdom works this way. The thoughts of the words enter the heart and produce if you will keep it watered and keep it nurtured and not let it get choked out. And if you understand it, and it will produce manifold times over. That's not heaven and hell. That's, he saved us not just out of hell, but he saved us into his kingdom. And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so one of the goals in our life should be to enter the kingdom of God and to, and to walk into that promise. And the kingdom of God, we know, is peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I just feel bad when there's people that are only thinking about heaven and hell and just, well, are you saved? And you don't want to go to hell, you want to go to heaven? Okay, I'll, okay, I'll say whatever you tell me to say, and I'll, you know, and I'll sign whatever you want me to sign, and I'll jump in off whatever water you want me to jump into. I just don't want to go to hell. That might be an okay start, but boy, that is not where we're supposed to be headed. We're being saved unto salvation, unto a kingdom of God that we're supposed to go, come out of the darkness and get into the light and I think in some ways, uh, this is where it's just, we got so much room that we can do that. But our problem is we think so temporal. We just think about just this earthly time. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Again, what a beautiful picture in tiny with what Tammy said. He, he came to reconcile the world, not to just uh, uh, beat it up or to, to always try to teach it something. I mean, it's like he came to have the world hooked back up to with him, not counting their trespasses against them. He is he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we're not just saved from evil, we were saved into something, the kingdom of God, which is, righteous, is one of those things is righteousness. And one of the definitions for righteousness is integrity, virtue, purity of life. But listen to this one. Correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. We were, sa we were brought into righteousness of being correct in our thinking. Being correct in our feeling. Man, when I woke up, finally got out of bed this morning, I got, I got to, I got to redo this feeling I got. Because I was still looking for this gigantic spider to show up in my, you know, because it was just, it got so real to me over and over uh, dreaming this thing. And then, of course, that ends up being acting. Let me say this, righteousness, this doctor, when I was listening to him, made this statement. He says, health is not being not sick. See, we got what we call health care, but most of our system is based on our health care system. In our Western thinking, so much of it is uh, health care is when you get sick, we, or you get a problem, we come in and we try to fix it. But living healthy isn't just not sick. There's a lot of people that they, they're, they're not sick, they're not in pain, they're not, you know, they have no disease that they know of or whatever else, but they're not really healthy.
we were, we were, our bodies were created to be healthy. You know, our bodies really weren't created to be abused. That's why I don't believe that, God, I personally don't believe that God throws horrible things at us to teach us stuff. I don't believe he, uh, listen, I, I don't believe you have to get sick to appreciate your health. I don't think you have to lose your arm to appreciate that you got two arms. I don't think you have to lose your eyesight to appreciate your eyesight. I think you can just willfully say, I really appreciate my eyes. I appreciate my hearing. I appreciate my body. I appreciate being healthy. I don't have to get sick to know how I appreciate it. Anybody say amen to that? And part of it is just making a choice to be thankful. And that's what we're saying today is, man, Lord, I'm thankful you are God and you saved me. And I don't have to go to the pits of hell to decide I want to go to heaven. I really have no desire. Some people said that, that God took them to heaven. I thought, man, do not do that to me. I, I, don't need, I don't need that to make my decision. I don't need to be broke to know I like to be wealthy. That's why I'm saying bless me. I'm not waiting for a crisis to teach me something. I'd just rather listen to God without a crisis. You know, you know how many crises kids skip when they just listen to their parents? You know how many times we can skip so many things if we just listen? So, <clears throat> righteousness, just like health is not being not sick, righteousness is not just being without sin. And yet our focus sometimes is just get people out of sin and get people out of that. Oh, man, finally they quit doing that. Oh, thank God they quit doing that. But righteousness isn't just not sinning. Righteousness is being, as Tammy said, is being empowered. Righteousness is thinking right, feeling right, acting right, and having what's right. And when... Christ became sin that we might become righteous, no longer walking in life just waiting to have something hit us or blow us or, you know, but uh, Jesus, he's not just uh, waiting for us to, you know, to, to get out in the wilderness and to get in trouble. He's just saying, cry out to me now. Listen to what I'm going to teach you and I'll, I'll empower you. I'll still stay seated. I'll empower you to live. I'll empower you. Righteousness really means we actually get to come into his presence. Mark and I were, and our team were talking about this. Righteous allows us to come into his presence and fit, belong. Absolutely know that we're welcome. It's, it'd be like if, if I walked into President Trump's office, can you imagine this? Can you imagine if I flew down to Washington, D.C. and said, I want to see the president and the guy, he says, who, who are you? I said, I'm John Williamson. Ask, talk, talk to Trump. And, I, and all of a sudden, poof, Secret Service, everybody's moving. <laughs> Come right in. And I walk into President Trump's office and I just sit down. I sit down and, you know, I get up there. He's at his desk and I sit on his desk. How's it going? Hey, I was wondering about... What are you really doing with all these twi Twitters? You know, what's your plan on, on provoking all this stuff, you know? And have them just sit there and usher everybody else out of the room and just say, John, this is what's really going on. This is what I'm doing this, and this is what I'm doing this, and this is what we got going on over here. What do you think about this, John? You know, in some ways, that would be so blasted cool. You know? To really be on the inside and not have to depend on what everybody else was saying about him and whatever, and just sit there and have him not worry a thing about, you know, me blabbering to anybody or whatever else, but just have him say, oh, John, come in and sit down. Let me show you. This is what's going on. This is why I'm doing this. You know, things that his own daughter doesn't know. Where are you going with that, John? That's a picture of what I see of righteousness. I get to walk into the throne room of God, sit down right beside God and just say, what are you doing? Oh, John, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. I call you friend. I don't call you stranger. I'm not ashamed of you. I open up my whole heart to you. You have total access. 
I'm not withholding one thing from you. I'm not playing any secret games with you, John. I open up totally to you. You are in right standing with me. You can't get in a closer position with me than you are right now. You have total access to everything I got in my head, my heart, and in my access, and anything you need, by the way. You know, just like if I walked out of Trump said, oh, by the way, my road is really crappy. Can you get it paved? Oh, yeah, I'll take care of that. And the next week, you know that happens. That literally happens. And it's happening to our friends over in Burma. The vice president came to honor the widow of Pastor Tong because he'd heard about, you know, he knew about the family. And after the funeral and all that, he came a week later. They brought in this entourage of, of cars and, and uh, you know, of the whole deal with all the bodyguards. And he walks into the house of Pastor Tong, a real simple home. And he's on the edge of town. And it's this road that's just full of potholes and all that. And he walks in and honors the widow and spends some time with them. And, and then he walk, as he walks out, he says, this road will be fixed. I get, I, I'm looking for it. The next time I go there, I expect that road to be paved. Why? Because he just happened to know the vice president of the country, and all that he's got to do is say, guys, put this on the list, and it's going to get done. We have access to the living God. We were not just saved so that we would not sin and wouldn't mess up. We were saved unto the kingdom, and the kingdom is righteousness, and that kingdom is where we know and feel and have absolute confidence that we can walk right into the office of the Lord God Almighty and say, what are you doing? What's happening? And, uh, and, and sometimes I go, we're just... any." You listen to some of the greatest people that walk with God, the theologians that study God, and almost all of them say, man, we're so fallen so short of what he has for us. Why? Because we're still playing this game down here in this temporal world. He became poor that we might be rich, and we think that's about having money in our bank account. And sometimes I used to say, yeah, so much more than that, it does include that. I want to just say, I don't think it even includes that anymore. Get it out of your head that his wealth makes you have temporary blessings down here, and that should be the goal. Because the truth of the matter is, Jesus walked this earth, and he didn't have that much finances, but he, had, but he walked this earth with power, with wisdom, he made many wealthy. Here's what I'm trying to say. Jesus isn't just trying to save us so that we quit sinning. He's trying to save, he's trying to save us into the kingdom so we walk on earth with confidence and with the power. Literally, folks, we've been given the power to heal people. He said, go heal the sick. And we can actually go proclaim this gospel. And, and does it take money? Does it take plane tickets? Yeah, but sometimes I just, want, I just think we're missing it when we're thinking temporal too much. And we forget that who we really are. I have access. I guarantee if I had access to walk into President Trump's office or whoever was president and they absolutely loved me and adored me and, and thought highly of me, I guarantee you there'd be things I could just whisper things and they'd get done. And we have access to God. Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. You know what I think is super strange? In this world, there's people building big businesses and multi-billion dollar businesses so fast right now. It's just, isn't it nuts? And then they have all this power and they have all this stuff. And, and, uh, and then there's people building huge ministries. And, and in some ways, it's like, you know, and then there's people doing inc incredible things in sports and, and, and talent and singing. And then it's almost like, well, I don't know if you ever feel, but once in a while I look at my life and say, man, what? What am I even here for? I don't do any of those things. I don't even plan to do any of those things. And maybe this 
I don't think it'll sound strange to you, but I, I go, man, I'm blessed because I see things that people never got to see. I hear things that people, billions of people have never heard, and most people on the earth today don't have a clue what I hear and what I see. I walk with God. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm going to live with him forever. People say, well, how come, how come this isn't happening? Or, or, are you believing for these big things? No, not really. <laughs> no, not really. Are you believing for billions of dollars? No, not really. I, I mean, I talk about it's enough problem just to mow this grass out here for me in the summertime if it rains. You know what billions of dollars would be? Maintenance like you can't believe. It would suck the life out of me. I hope it doesn't happen. But whatever. But what I love is to walk in. I've been saved into life, and I have now the power to give life. You may think your life is insignificant, and, and so, but maybe this sounds arrogant to you, but isn't it incredible that in Sturgis, South Dakota, a little church called Believer's Fellowship, these words are being declared that the world has never heard and that can change anybody's life and turn it, anybody's life totally radically around. This message that, that we've heard just today and what we just sang today is God's message that will last for eternity. If the world had any clue what was going on, their whole focus would be on places like this to come and find life. Because we don't have a billion dollars. We have, we don't have, we, we have access. And we believe it. Can we believe it more? Yeah. Watch the videos of being hit by a car and you'll want to pay attention. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think about when you're out there? Mickey? Because while you're taking care of this person that's dying, you've got to be glancing over your shoulder because there's so many people. What's going on? <laughs> We can become more aware of what we have. Father, I thank you in the precious name of Jesus. So if I died right now, if a meteorite hit us right here, we'd all be just happy and all get out. We'd be home. We would be in your presence. But Father, somehow there's... It's this incredible thought... That we've, what we've heard and what we've seen is the truth that is going to last forever and ever and ever. And I thank you for the privilege and for the honor and for the incredible opportunity. Father, as I was describing walking into Trump's office, it started captivating me. What would it be like for me, John Williamson from Sturgis, South Dakota, to walk into the White House and walk and have everybody in there, all the Secret Service and everybody just awesome, change everything and say, John's here. He wants to see Trump. Open the door. Oh, what would that be like? What would that feel like? <laughs> To be a nobody walking into the president of the United States and knowing he's going to listen to anything I say. And he's going to tell me anything I ask. Father, we have much more than that. Each one of us in this room has access to the king on the throne that will reign forever. And I pray and I cry out to you, Lord, not through accidents, not through tragedy, not through sickness, and not through poverty, but through your living word coming into our hearts. Open up our minds and enlarge our hearts and our capacity to, to believe and to understand the word of this kingdom. That we may feel it, hear it, and see it, and then, Father, without a doubt, we'll do it. We can walk on this earth without a dime in our pocket, but knowing that anybody, that, Father, we can reach out and touch somebody and say, be healed, and they're healed. Hallelujah. We can reach out and say, this is the word of life, and they can be born again. I thank you for the power. I thank you for righteousness. I just thank you. I just thank you. I just thank you. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Help us. We cry out to you.
Amen. Amen. Man, go out and be just extraordinary. Extraordinary. <laughs>